What is up, guys? Welcome to the Triage Method Podcast Q&A edition with me, Gary McGowan, and my co-host, Mr. Patrick Farrell. Patty, how are you this Thursday? For the Positively list? fantastic, Gary. Could not be better. Although, I am saying that of a Sunday, and things could have got significantly worse by Thursday. Who knows? They probably will, realistically. You never yeah. know. <laughs> but for today, basically what we're going to, what we're going to discuss is some of the the transferable lessons that I've learned in my first year of, of medicine. So hopefully there's a couple of things you can take away um, from my experience that are applicable, you know, whether you're just trying to study and learn things, or if you're just trying to maybe just get more stuff done in your life in general, because there are a number of, of lessons that are transferable here. I'll probably do a video specifically on this at some point, because one of the things I, ca- I found when I was trying to look at the experiences of medical students in Ireland is that a lot of the information comes from the US, you know, it's always American medical students with their vlogs and stuff. And if you've watched any of them, you'll know that American medical students tend to be, they catastrophize quite a bit, and they kind of make, make it out like studying medicine is like a a vocation and that it takes over your life, you can't do anything else, and you're going to hate yourself. And it's the worst. And yeah, I'm just not really about that life so and just on this point i would like to say that i have said to gary multiple times that he should most definitely vlog more about his experience both running a business a rather successful business and might i add uh and doing like full-time medicine as well right because obviously it's a unique perspective and so if you would be so kind wherever you are listening viewing or whatever engaging in this please put a comment there or, you know, email Gary and be like, Gary, I want to see more vlogs. If that is in fact something that people want to see. Anyway, go on, Gary. Yeah, realistically, it probably is. Because like, as I said, this is one of the things that I that I, I just couldn't really find online. Um, and Patty probably kicked me for this. He's like, you mean you found something that there was no that there was a market for and that you couldn't find and you're not going to make it yourself, you idiot. Um, yeah, cool. yeah. <laughs> That's how I'm feeling at the moment. Because when I first was trying to find out about studying medicine um, in Ireland, there was very little out there for from like an Irish student perspective. And there definitely wasn't anything out there on Irish students who were studying medicine and, you know, trying to run a business and partake in training, etc. So even trying to run a business. Are you saying that we're all only really trying? I just don't want to make it sound like, you know, yeah. So, you know, I'm a straight A student and also a successful business and yeah. I'm like Jag. Yeah. I mean, it's true. Like, but I mean, other than that, we, we try not to, to brag around here, but anyway, the transfer of lessons, right? So there are, there are a number of things. And, and the first thing I suppose, like, and this isn't specific to medicine, it's specific to any degree. And Paddy obviously knows the same from his biochemistry degree is that the like rabbit, the rabbit holes in any area of science and scientific subjects go far deeper than you would think. And the reason I say that is because often you kind of get the impression that, you know, even as a personal trainer myself, studying, studying physiology, um, you might think that you have a good grasp on something like physiology or biochemistry or any of these kind of central subjects just because you kind of have a loose idea but you never really get the appreciation for how deep the rabbit holes go on these subjects however what i would say is that the deeper the deeper you go into different subjects especially like doing your own reading around what you're taught in college and again this is generalizable to any degree you start to see all the the layers peeled back and you start to find out where there's actually uncertainty. So what you'll find out is that some of the most basic assumptions that we have for, you know, some things, how how things work in the body, you might find that like the researchers that are experts in that area, that there's actually a lot of uncertainty that goes into that. And they're kind of saying, well, we're actually not sure of the specific mechanism of this or that. And that for me is something that I've always found absolutely just just fascinating because what you'll what you'll find is that people that have a superficial understanding of something they'll speak with great certainty on a topic so they'll say this is how this works uh this is the mechanism boom 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 and it's all really clear however when you begin to go deeper down the rabbit hole and you encounter encounter people who have greater expertise as i said they'll, they'll generally be speaking in very uncertain terms they're like look, it seems like things might work this way. We're not entirely sure, you know, this new protein was just discovered and we're not sure how that interacts with other proteins within the cell. And we can't, we're not exactly sure of all the mechanisms involved. And as I said, Paddy, that's probably something you can agree with from your own studies, both in and out of college as well, you know? 
Yeah, hundred percent. I always like to make a mockery and just say it's all made up. Um, but of course, it it does to an outside observer appear to be all made up. Where you're just like, yeah, I think we have a good grasp of this, and then it's like, but there's this actual protein or enzyme or whatever, and it's like, yeah, it seems to be actually quite important, but we have no idea what it does. You're like, how, like, how, like, how do you, <laughs> how do you then say you're a master or knowledgeable about a topic if you're like, yeah, this thing that we didn't even know existed could, a could actually be the main point, you know? But again, it is what it is. Yeah, so the actual lesson there being, because I want people to have lessons go away from this, the lesson is that there's always so much more that you can learn about any topic and that there is actually a return on investment often on learning things at a deeper level. Because, and sometimes that's actually... It has like a subtract a subtraction like effect because what it does is as you begin to learn more and more and more about a particular subject you can easier it's easier to spot bullshit and who's just bullshitting so you now know where to to uh, allocate your attention and you can just ignore certain people or certain sources of information so it's not necessarily that you now have you know a far better understanding of how this applies in the real world but rather you're like you're you're you have greater resistance to bullshit and that is a big part of it so there's definitely return on investment from going deeper on a lot of subjects you know one simple one go ahead just on that as well i think it's always very hard as well for individuals whether they're studying medicine studying like anything like you you run this risk of being a specialist and again basically only ever understanding one tree in the forest right when in reality that's not their task you were actually given you were tasked to understand the forest right um but it's, it's very hard to you know stay on that line where you need to actually understand all the trees in the forest so for some time you need to spend time like studying that individual tree you need to actually specialize so that you can then generalize, you know, and actually have a better picture. Because we will find is people that have a good overall picture, like a generalist view, are able to make connections between different things and contextualize information uh, a lot better. But it also makes their specialized knowledge uh, better as well. Um, like, for example, you might see something that said with regard to uh, rodent studies, and maybe you're doing a deep dive on depression. That's something that like I did for my thesis. Um, and then because I have this other knowledge in like health and fitness and, you know, supplementation for, you know, endurance training and stuff like that. I'm like, the protocol you're using here to say that, like just a, a forced swim test, for example, in a rodent study, the protocol you're saying here, and then you're trying out these drugs to potentially, like you're using it as a model of depression and you're trying out these drugs and different interventions to see how that affects the depression. But you're using that as a proxy measure of depression. And if you had knowledge in another field, you'd realize that there's all these other like supplements that people give to what effectively is a forced swim test in rodents to test the efficacy of these supplements. So that would actually just destroy your entire hypothesis because now you're saying that this is a model of depression, but there's these common you know, supplements like sodium bicarbonate that effectively cures depression using your model. You know, so like the, you need to have this generalized knowledge to have specialized knowledge. And this is always something that I always go back and forth on. And I know you do as well. It's like, how do you keep, like get generalized knowledge while also getting specialized knowledge while also keeping the generalized knowledge, you know, generalized? Like it's it's something that I kind of struggle with myself. Yeah, no, that that is a really good point. And like something I try to do to try to come combat that is like, once you've gone deep deep on a particular subject, you're able to appreciate the ignorance that you would have displayed if you talked about this subject two or three years ago. So then what you do when you encounter a new subject is like what I'll try and do is like I'll generally speak in a lot more uncertain terms because even though I might not know like what's at the end of that rabbit hole, I know that there's a lot more that I probably don't know. So I'm just kind of beginning to appreciate my own ignorance in that situation. You know, one of the, the places that this was highlighted to me was that, you know, we did so much physiology in first year medicine like it was like you could nearly call it like a physiology physiology degree because the amount that was actually there um, one of the subjects that takes up most of the time and within that you know some of the stuff in there was uh, skeletal muscle physiology and that's something that I would I would know know a lot about um, just from like my own my own reading writing for triage my own studies just being interested in it um, and what I found was that you know when we were going through things like how muscles work we were getting the kind of 
level one, maybe level two understanding of how muscles work and the common theories used. However, like from my own reading, um, I knew that like, oh, there's actually there's these levels that go far beyond this that actually explain some of the phenomena that maybe he's glossing over as a lecturer. And I can appreciate that, right? I know he has a PhD in physiology. He he knows this stuff too, but he's teaching this to say, right, what's an adequate level of knowledge for a doctor who's going to have to put this into practice? And he's saying, right, if you have, you know, 70%, 80% of the understanding of how skeletal muscles work, that's probably good enough, you know, whereas I was able to see, all right, there's actually a lot more to this. So then what I was able to do then to when translating over to subjects that would be newer for me, like pharmacology, for example, I was able to say, or to, to realize immediately, like, all right, they're teaching us this understanding, this mechanism of action of how a drug works. I'm going to assume that that's wrong. You know, I'm going to learn it for the exam, but I'm going to assume it's wrong or not necessarily just wrong, but probably to some degree incomplete. And just not the whole story. Uh, yeah, just not the whole story, that there's probably more stuff um, going on. And, and, that, and that is the case then when you do start to look into things. So point there being lesson number one, the rabbit hole does go a lot, a lot, a lot deeper than you think, and that there's there's benefit to going deep, and it, it allows you to appreciate your ignorance in other areas. So, the second thing is prob probably relates directly, kind of to that point. And what I said was that you know, doctor doctors learn a lot more than you think. Um, I think that some people probably, get, and when I say learn a lot more, I'm going to actually change that to are taught a lot more because that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a deep understanding of something. Because one of the things that comes up is like. You know, people will say doctors uh, learn, you know, absolutely nothing about nutrition or something like that. And, that. and that's actually true. Like, like that is true. But but what I would say is that you are you are taught a lot of a lot of biochemistry. And what I would say is that if you, if you actually have learned that biochemistry properly and you've made the effort to go beyond uh, the information that's presented to you in lectures and stuff like that, you have the opportunity to have a fairly complete understanding of of the biochemistry that would underpin a lot of the things that you discuss when talking about nutrition. So it's not, I think people sometimes have this impression, and obviously I can say this because I was once this person, that kind of doctors just learn, oh, here are all these diseases and here are the drugs that work for those diseases. When in fact, like medical education is, it's quite comprehensive in terms of the, the physiology, the pharmacology, the biochemistry. And personally, like from my own experience in UCC, like I would say that, they do really do make an effort to link it all together quite well. And I think it's then on the student's part to take responsibility, to be able to link all of that information together well and to create a comprehensive understanding. Because obviously one of the criticisms a lot of the time in education and, and applies to doctors sometimes is that, you know, you just have this specialized knowledge and you know, you know, what to, when to give a drug, how much of a drug to give, but you don't necessarily understand how the body works. But, I'd kind of stand up for medical medical education in that context and say that no 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 they do really try and give you the platforms to be able to understand a lot of these topics especially insofar as they're within your scope of practice um you know nutrition dietetics they're their own professions they're not the role of a doctor um so so yeah i would say that medical education is absolutely uh, quite comprehensive and you probably do learn a lot more than you think and obviously i'm speaking as a first year but i'm a first year in graduate entry medicine. So first year in graduate entry medicine is basically the same as doing two years, your first two years in a standard medical degree. Um, so there's definitely, there, there, there's a lot in there. Um, you probably don't have anything to add to that. It's just fairly, no, sir. it is what it is. I actually think medical professionals learn biochemistry quite well. Um, well, I should say they are taught oh, biochemistry yeah, that's what quite well. Yeah. Um, and like th the interesting thing there is like, Obviously, Patty, like biochemistry is like one of, if not your favorite subject. And in medicine, um, it's probably actually been probably my favorite, my favorite subject too, or close to it. Like, I think it's interesting, but I'm also coming from someone who's, I worked in personal training, always interested interest in nutrition, would have had some passive interest in biochemistry that would have been strengthened then from speaking to you. So I had a lot of the prerequisite knowledge going into it. So as a result, it was kind of like, oh yeah, I kind of know this stuff. I don't have to work that hard at it. Whereas people who hadn't done, done it before, they tend to hate it. And if you look up like- yeah, it has, a, it has a, a high barrier of entry. That's yeah. what I was like, you know? Yeah, and a lot of like the the memes that people have on these medical meme pages and stuff like that, they're always complaining about biochemistry, about how you remember it for five minutes and then it's gone. Um, but yeah, there you go. That's that. The third lesson is, 
is that like again this is something that you'll agree with and that is goes beyond just medicine and that is that everything is interesting and i say that because i think sometimes people get scared away um from complex subjects because of how complex they seem but when you have a structured approach of trying to learn something and building up from a very low level of knowledge to a high level of knowledge your enjoyment scales with how accomplished you are in the subject that's the same as work you know if you're if you're shit at your job and you hate your job you know one way to probably improve your enjoyment of that job is to get competent you know because when you're competent at something suddenly you have responsibility people trust you you're able to you know play around with ideas you can be more creative whereas you have no potential to be creative in your thought process or to create independent thought if you don't have the prerequisite level of knowledge of a subject to even begin to think about it you know um so you do have to overcome that initial stage of grasping the basics and then all subjects just they really do open up and of course you're going to have your preferences but i think the lesson there is that if you're scared of learning something and you've always hated a subject give it some time you might still hate it but there's a strong chance that your enjoyment with will scale with your understanding of the topic would you agree no 100 i always think like when you're learning something initially like there's always going to be that barrier of entry that like level of frustration like i always use the example of something like microsoft excel like when you start using it you're like this is just frustrating i don't know how to do these things i don't know what to like i just it's just frustrating right and that's the same with the education but once you start understanding okay so i just use these short codes oh i just you know this is how you move things around and this is oh it's actually really beneficial it's sped up my ability to actually get stuff done like i'm assuming obviously you're using microsoft yeah. excel you know regularly not just like every so often um but you know if it's something that you're like oh this is actually beneficial once i got over that barrier of frustration where i just didn't know how to do anything so it was just it took me two hours to do something that you know should have only taken five minutes um so it's obviously frustrating it's the same with education like the the initial and knowledge acquisition it's going to be frustrating because you're like i have no context for this like don't know how to fit these pieces together it just it just seems excessively hard but once you get over that and you get into a good rhythm then it's like okay no i actually this is i actually like this yes sir um so yeah like that that's obviously something that people can appreciate even from an exercise perspective because a lot of you listening to this podcast you're exercise enthusiasts you know when you when you speak about exercise you speak very differently about exercise to the people that are walking around the street you know most people think exercise and they think oh god the thought of that oh no i don't want to work out whereas most of us are like oh man i can't wait to train later on and again it's because we've we've surpassed that entry stage you know we've surpassed that ability to learn different exercises and begin to overcome the severe discomfort that one experiences at the start or the extreme muscle soreness that you have all those things they're the prerequisites that you need to overcome to begin enjoying exercise which is why we always say you know on the podcast and we always say to people that we work with that look i know these things are uncomfortable at the beginning but trust me in months and years down the line you can definitely become the person who if not if not loves exercise at least enjoys one specific mode of exercise like that's generally the case um, most of the time so that would be the lesson. Um, if you dislike something, you think something is complicated, maybe give it a bit of time, a bit of effort, and and see how that changes. Um, lesson number four uh, is that learning is far more superior or far superior when applied practically. And this is something that everyone will agree with. You know, one of the the best decisions that I made in in the first year of medicine was to partake in something that's called sim wars. And Sim Wars is it's emergency medicine simulation training. So basically what happens is different consultants and doctors will come in and they will uh, guide us through like basically educating you at the beginning. You work through different cases in a team. So, for example, you're on the airway, you're on circulation, you're the assessment doctor, you're the leader, etc. You basically start to appreciate, right, how is how is the knowledge that we're learning in the classroom? How does that begin to be applied practically? You know, because you can spend all this time learning off all these, you know, treatment algorithms and mechanisms of actions of drugs, etc. And if you just have this disease, this is what you do. But obviously, things are far more complex in the real world. And one of the experiences gained from that is deeper learning because you're forced to apply practically like you have to make a decision. It's not a memorization thing. You have to make this decision now. And also you begin to take all the knowledge that's from the classroom and apply it in this real situation. So now it's no longer biochemistry, pharmacology, physiology, anatomy. It's real person, real problem. What are you going to do? That's what it is. And working with 
people who have specialized in certain areas, such as, you know, we had uh, anesthetists, uh, emergency medicine specialists. When you get to expertise from those people, they further enlighten us on, on what we mentioned in point one, uh, which is that the rabbit hole goes much deeper than you think. So, you know, they'll say, oh, yeah, you guys learned this in the classroom. Yeah, you think that's how it works. Yeah, not really in practice. That's just not what happens, you know. <laughs> um, and it's like, oh, you learned this list of drugs. Yeah, all we use in CUH is this. So, like, why are you learning all this? You know, that sort of stuff. And that that basically enlightens you on all the things that are yet to be learned, which is humbling as well, because you realize that, oh, I actually am a first year medical student. And I know that in 10 years time, you know, I can see that I'll, I'll be like this person and they will be looking back at someone like me and thinking, God, that idiot knew nothing at the time. So that's humbling. And the fact that you're forced to apply things practically, just a, a far more uh, useful way of learning. And obviously anyone that has ever um, learned some sort of trade or something like that will will appreciate that, that, you know, you can know all the ins and outs in the science of how a particular thing works. But if you don't know what tool to use you don't know how to build something like it's it's like all right all your theoretical knowledge is like who cares you know do you agree a hundred percent could not agree more perfect so if you have the opportunity to, to apply something in practice guys try to apply it in practice um so yeah that's really that and then the fifth and final one is something that's applicable to everyone you don't have to be studying but it is you can do far more than you think you can and i know this is something you'll agree agree with patty but, you know, it, what, what, what was that? Um, you mentioned it in one of your recent videos, Parkinson's Law. Yeah, that was what it was yes. called. Yeah, so basically the amount of time, what was it? You, you repeated there. The amount of time that's required to complete a task will basically fill the amount of time that's available, something like yes. that. Yeah, so basically the, the, like we end up set, setting up our lives kind of in a, in a secondary manner. So we see what we have to achieve. We see the time that we have available. And then we our behavior then follows that pattern so that we basically like, like the best example is if you've ever had an assignment, you like you have 12 weeks to do it so easy, but you still do it the night before, <laughs> you know, every time that's what happens. You know, that's what people do, or even maybe a week before or two weeks before if you're keen, but no one's going home the day you get that assignment and saying, all right, I need to get on this uh, right now. Um, well, I am because that's because I'm a weirdo. But anyway, <laughs> but very often that's not the case. Um, so, like for for me, what was interesting this year is that I I was basically after taking up uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So obviously, just specific t time commitments associated with that, and that you have to be at a per particular place at a particular time. I had all the hours of commitment to <clears throat> in college itself, and like medicine is it's quite a busy degree in terms of time that you're actually in college but also you're expected to do a lot of additional reading um, to and, and studying and stuff to be able to get to the level that's required for, for your exams because, you know, they are relatively challenging. Um, but then obviously coaching with triage, <coughs> writing stuff with triage, um, putting out our, our social media, that sort of stuff. Basically, point there being, I had a lot of different stuff going on, including the, the sim wars, the emergency medicine simulation that was training a couple of times per week. There was a competition eventually, which we won obviously uh -huh. um, <laughs> but 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 yeah the the point there being that all those different things as a result of having all those things in my life what i had to do was review the way that i allocate time elsewhere and i discussed this in a video this week about social media and basically what i ended up doing was saving literally tens and tens and tens of hours per month by basically deactivating my instagram for most of the year spending a lot less time on social media um and that gave me just this uh, loads of free time. I no longer wasted uh, as much time doing things like, uh, well, it's not wasting time. Like, I, I don't want people to think this, but, you know, I, I'm not going out for walks just casually listening to podcasts or sitting down on the couch listening to podcasts. I'm not saying that's a bad thing to do. It's a good thing to do. But in my case, I could now listen to podcasts while I was commuting, while I was walking to, to jiu-jitsu. You know, there was a very specific purpose. So everything pretty much in my day from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to sleep, it had a specific purpose. And I don't think that's, I'm not encouraging you to live like that. And I don't think that that is a way that is sustainable to live for the long term because I was effectively just wired all of the time seven days a week 24 hours a day you know th that that's just the way it was but what i am saying is that i could i could never have imagined that i would be able to come out the other end of studying you know first year medicine being 
a relatively good student having done sim wars having been able to train and having been able to 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 keep up work with triage a couple of years ago like if i because when i was working in in peak health even and doing triage i felt just as stressed stressed if not more stressed the same in physio when i was in physio far less work involved in medicine far less work um and I, I was the exact same level of, you know, stressed or not having free time, et cetera. So the lesson there being that the, my time was basically filled up regardless of what I was doing. But as I began to strip back any of the non-necessities or necessary things that I was spending my time on, I was able to fill in more valuable um, tasks and w within there. And, and that was ultimately, ultimately to my benefit. So lesson there being, you can probably do a lot more than you think you can. 100%. I don't think to add to that because it just, yeah. it just makes sense. Like, just again, <laughs> yeah, like literally assess your life. Look at the, you know, they always use that 80, 20 rule. Like, you know, 20% of the stuff you're doing is contributing to 80% of the results, you know? So it's like, look at that. What, like, what are the main things that need to be done? Okay, cool. Get them done. Prioritize around them. And then the other stuff, you know, assess that and be like, is that actually contributing to my life? Mm, you know, is your copious amount of, you know, four hours per day on social media, looking at TikTok videos, you know, is that conducive to your goals? Probably not. And I hate that thing where people always say it's like, oh, I'm just, you know, filling free time. If it's a significant portion of your day, it's not free time. That's just how you intend to spend your time day to day. It's like, that, like, it's not, you know, oh, I, I, I can't do anything else at that time or I couldn't, you know, whatever. It's like, no, you just chose to spend four hours of your day on social media. That was a, a choice. You could have easily downloaded, I don't know, the Kindle app or something, downloaded a book, flick through the book, get two, three pages read in that same five minutes that you, you know, flick through 20 different Instagram pictures, you know? Yeah, and I mean, like, it, it is ultimately, like, your choice to, to, to create that hierarchy of what's actually important. And that's even within college. I mean, like, there was many times where I just said to myself, yeah, I'm not going to that lecture because... Yeah, it might be interesting, but I kind of have a grasp of that concept or I know that that lecture is just really slow at talking so I can actually learn this. I can learn this faster. And that was actually the interesting thing about that is that I was so efficient in the third semester because it was all online. So they had to put their lectures up online. So I'm just putting these lectures on double speed. And now what I'm getting is right. Firstly, they're talking in double speed. So I've saved myself an hour of, of time, you know, if it was a two hour lecture. But secondly, I'm able to study the lecture while I'm watching it so that I don't have to go back later and do it. Because sometimes, you know, I, I might be you might do a little bit of daydreaming in a lecture or I might be kind of flicking back and forth between my emails and being in the lecture. So they're the types of things that, that I started to kind of try and weed out basically and that includes just not attending lectures when they were on like if there was a lecture on and i was like i probably don't need that you know some of the anatomy stuff uh, in the first semester it was kind of musculoskeletal anatomy like come on gary you should probably know where the biceps are by now like you're not going to that lecture just to satisfy yourself um so instead what i focused on was right like you said what it, what what's the the 20 percent um it's it's more than 20 percent, but what's the 20 percent of the content that you really need to focus on and then begin to focus on that. And in addition, what do you what are you like most interested in? So what goes beyond the exams, you know? Um, and they're the types of things that I started to think about, and that allowed me to far better um, allocate my time. Yeah, and just on that, like you would think an institution that is supposedly about learning would have, you know, maximized the strategy to ensure that learning occurs. However, for the majority of people, that's just not the case. You know, like if you can learn a bit of information and it takes you yourself, if, if we if we just said, oh, you have to learn about X topic, right? And you can learn that in your, yourself, just reading about it, watching, I don't know, YouTube videos, whatever, and you can learn about it in 20 minutes. Like, why are you still going to an hour lecture to learn about that information, you know? So effectively what I'm saying is that the way universities, colleges, most education platforms are set up, it, it's purely tradition it's an archaic you know method of teaching so don't be afraid to think outside of the box and develop a strategy of learning that suits you and your time commitments and needs you know like again like i said like if you're going to go to subjects that you already have a firm grasp of you know that's not going to be the best use of your time when there's other subjects that perhaps you don't have a firm grasp on and could be you could spend that time you know reading up on those and just doing the briefest overview 
run through of the topic that was going to be discussed in that lecture, you know? And like Gary said, like there's going to be modalities, excuse me, perhaps that are more conducive to your actual learning and understanding. Like again, you might be like Gary and you'd be like, all right, actually just watching a video lecture and studying as I go in double speed is more conducive to your learning, you know? So again, you should ask your institution, first of all, is that provided? And if it isn't, then you can develop strategies to accommodate that. For example, you can get your friend to go to the lecture that is also in there that prefers to be in a lecture and record the lecture, like the voice notes of the lecture, and then get them to send it to you and listen to those voice notes with the lecture slides in front of you with your book open and do it on your own time. You know, If you know that that's a better method of you studying and getting the information in your head. What I'm saying is the education process it's not the, the most efficient way to learn information. It's just the way that has been traditionally put forth, you know, because again, like you think about like, where did it all start? It's like, all right, how do I transmit information? Like textbooks, you know, they're, they're not easily accessible to everyone, you know? So you have to come to the, the class and get the information that's in my head. And I'm going to have to write this down on the blackboard and you're going to have to copy it down in your notes, right? Like that's where it started. This, that's not what we do now. You know, so the entire structure is based on something that we don't do anymore, but the structure hasn't changed, you know, like it's, it's archaic, you know. So if you realize that the, the method of teaching is not conducive to your learning, then don't just accept that. Find a method of learning that is conducive to your learning. You know, like you should have a tailored approach to your education, because after all, it is your education. It's not the education of the person teaching you. Yep, I Completely agree. Um, I don't think I've I have anything more to add. But overall, you know, the take-home points are: rabbit holes go deeper than you think. Get stuck down them. There's pleasure to be found there, not actual rabbits holes. You weirdos. Um, number two uh, was that you know doctors do probably learn a lot more than you think, but that there's always more to learn, um, and that you know medicine is not just taught in such a way that here's a disease, here's a drug. That's definitely not the case. <laughs> it's the meme in some cases. Um, number three is that everything is interesting, and before you write off a particular subject or task or language, uh, recognize that the better you get at something, some pleasure does tend to, to come with that, and some of you might be in jobs at the moment where you've always had a cynical attitude and you've never put in any effort because you don't like it. And there's probably something to be gained by trying to become more competent in that, um, even if you don't plan on staying with that long term. Then learning is far more superior uh, when applied practically. So you, if you ever have an opportunity to engage in some way of, of practically applying your learning, um, I would advise you doing so. I know, I know a lot of students um, in my class were kind of hesitant. They were like, oh, we won't have enough time. You know, we don't want to do that. It's it's not examined. You know, it's not it's an it's extracurricular. We're not going to be examined on this. So why should I spend my time on that? But long term, ultimately, if you can apply information practically, it's just superior, especially if the information has to be applied practically anyway in the future. <laughs> like You're not just learning it for the sake of it um, in any applied degree anyway. Um, and then finally, you can do far more than you think you can. So remember that Parkinson's law, how much how much of your day is just kind of filler to allow basically what you need to do to expand into your whole day, taking away from your overall free time or time that you could allocate to things that could potentially make your life better. Um, yeah, Doc always calls that discipline equals freedom in terms of like, just be disciplined, do the work that needs to be done. And then you can have all the free time that you want. You know, like if you're like, I have two work, two hours of work to do today and it takes you 12 hours to do that work because you're constantly you know, checking social media. Oh, I have to go, you know, do this other thing and I'll go to the shop and I'll do the whatever. And it's like, you never actually get the work done when you could have just got it all done, gone out of your mind and then had the entire day free to do whatever you wanted. You know, so again, discipline does equal freedom. Yep. On that note, Laura's here probably laughing at me because today is Sunday. And what I'm doing is basically no work afternoon. So no phone, no laptop afternoon time. Got my seven hours of work done this morning. So that'll that'll do it for a Sunday, I think. And uh, that's a that's basically a prime a prime example. Um, and I'm not always the best at doing that. And I would never want to try and take that badge because I'm I can be def I can definitely fall guilty. Um, to just not taking free time that could potentially be there. But if you are someone that struggles with that, set yourself a specific time, you know, cut it off, say, right, you know, on, on Saturdays, on Sundays, boom, no no later than than 12 uh, or 1. Um, so, yeah, I'm getting myself in trouble saying this now because she's fucking laughing at me. But there you go. That's because she always wants to fight anyway. 
<laughs> she is from Caroline, you know, you know what they're like there. I know yourself. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, Gary, where can people find us? What services can they engage in? All of that fun stuff. Uh, as always, you can subscribe to the Triage Method community, or, or Triage Method newsletter, rather. Do that first. That's our newsletter that goes out each week. You can also join the Triage Method community, which is our free Facebook group uh, for productive discussions, posts, uh, first notice of our content, etc. You can pre-register your interest for the Coaches Corner, which is an upcoming service. It's a membership site dedicated to personal trainers and interested trainees who want to learn more about, one, the kind of background knowledge that goes into personal training and training and nutrition, et cetera. But as we touched on in this podcast, how you actually apply that practically. So all that physiology stuff, what does that actually mean? All that nutritional biochemistry stuff, what does that mean in the real world? What does it mean for the client in front of you? And that's ultimately going to be the, the primary goal of the coach's corner. So you can pre-register your interest for that below. You will get um, a discount uh, upon launch and you're not committing to anything by pre-registering that interest. And other than that, subscribe to the YouTube channel. We're putting out a lot of content there. It helps us when you do subscribe. It helps us when you like the videos um, and hopefully it'll help you see the content sooner and not miss out on anything. And then you can subscribe or follow us on other social media platforms, namely Instagram, Twitter, not really Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and Facebook, you could say. 100% Kerry, I have nothing else to say, so enjoy everyone. There you go, it's too easy. <laughs>